Um, you'll probably notice there's a common theme because in some books in the New Testament, Paul's letters in particular, Paul likes to make really long arguments and they're logical, especially in Romans, and it just keeps going for like 16 chapters. And then there's John. John's arguments are more like a wheel spinning around, hitting the same point over and over again. And so we could have the same sermon five weeks in a row right now because it's the same point in every single chapter because he thinks we ought to love one another. So we're trying to hit different points as we go. But if it feels like you've heard this sermon before, it's because John keeps saying the same thing. So we keep saying the same thing because apparently we need to hear it. So today we turn our attention to 1 John 4. We begin looking at verses 1 through 6. Hear the word of our Lord for us today. Dear friends, John writes, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of Jesus Christ, give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Christ so that the eyes of our hearts might be enlightened. Help us to know the hope to which you have called us the riches of the glorious inheritance in the saints and the immeasurable greatness of your power at work in us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So as we have mentioned several times already, one of the conflicts in the church, in, in John's churches, was centered around the real physical body of Jesus. Some people, likely influenced by Greek philosophers, simply could not imagine a God who would enter our physical world and have a real body. It offended their sensibilities. And then to imagine that this God would not only have a body, but would then suffer and die in that body was simply beyond anything that they could comprehend or fathom or get their mind around. It made no sense. And so they began to teach that Jesus didn't really have a body. You see, they said, what happened is the spirit of Jesus came and filled somebody, but when the suffering happened, Jesus left. And it was just that body that was some other body, not Jesus himself that suffered and died because God could never suffer and die and God couldn't really have a body because God is perfect and bodies are corrupted. And so that could not have been really Jesus. And John rightly in his letter identifies that this is a denial of the gospel. If Jesus didn't have a body, then he could, he could not have been the new, rep, the new Adam, the new representative of humanity before God because he wasn't really human. So he couldn't have been our representative for God. He also couldn't have fulfilled the law on our behalf because he wasn't one of us. And if he couldn't do that, then he couldn't be the atoning sacrifice that pays for our sins. And so then we're not really saved through Jesus and there's no hope for us in Christ and so we should be pitied and it makes no sense anymore. The gospel is pointless if Jesus didn't have a real body, he argues. And so I just want to make one minor point on this and you can think about that theological stuff for a while if you want, but I want to make one point for us today. In this book that is all about how we need to love one another, John is very willing to draw firm and hard lines when it comes to people who are damaging the life of the church. John doesn't pull a lot of punches when he talks about these false teachers in this church. He says that they are false prophets. He says that they're the Antichrist. I don't know if that's a minor insult or not, but it seems like if you're against Jesus, it's probably pretty bad in the church. Um, they are, they, have this, they are from the world. They are not from God. You don't have to wonder where John stands on these people. They are bad. They should not be listened to. They should be driven out of the church. 
He's not as colorful as Paul. Paul says when he talks about those circumcised that they should go all the way and cut everything off. John isn't quite that crass in church. He's a little more subdued than that. But his point is just as clear. These people cannot be tolerated in your midst. What they're teaching is destructive to the life of the church. Sometimes love demands that we speak boldly and directly and even requires that we be angry and exclude people who are destructive and harmful to the life and the ministry of the church. We get this if we think about it for long. Think about the people that you love the most. If someone you love is being unfairly hurt and they're in danger from someone else, do you get angry? Should you get angry? Should you do something to protect and defend them? Of course you should. You might tell the, 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 the offending person, you're never welcome in my house again. You might block them on Facebook and you might block them on your phone. And if, you, if the one you love is in imminent danger, you will call the police and you will get them locked up. Because love springs into action and will exclude and will be angry to defend those they love when they are threatened by people out to harm them. That is the loving thing to do. It is not loving to feel bad if someone is being hurt and abused by someone else. It is loving to stop it. That is the loving thing to do. Sometimes love draws hard lines and makes hard decisions and love steps into conflict and it might even be angry to defend those who are being hurt. That is what it means to love sometimes. And so John's doing that for his church and then he returns to his theme of how those who truly belong to the church ought to love one another. And we'll pick it up at verse 7 this morning. John says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another... God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. The theme of these 15 verses is pretty clear. John uses the word love 27 times in 15 verses, roughly one and a half times in every single verse. So it's, it might be worth us thinking through how John defines love in this passage. And he says that love is revealed in the life and in the death and in the resurrection of Jesus. It is through his atoning sacrifice that we come to know what the love of God is like. And so love is the one who has been hurt reaching out to reclaim the wandering sinners like you and me. One of the key aspects of the gospel is simply this, God moves first. 
We did not first reach out to God and confess our sins and try to make it up to God and get back in God's good graces. The gospel is that while we were still sinners, while we were still rebelling, while we were still rejecting God, God came looking for us to seek us out and to be reconciled to us because God loved us first. God moves first in the gospel. And so we love like Jesus when we reach out to people who are sinners in our lives, to reach out to people who don't know God yet. The people who may have hurt us in the past with their unkind words or gossip or maybe ripped us off, and we offer them grace. Now, it's important, as I say, that I want to remind you, the first point today is that when someone's being hurt, we, we need to draw firm lines and keep people safe. And yet it's also true that as believers, we're called to forgive and show grace to those who do the hurting. It's hard sometimes to know how to make that work, isn't it? I was listening to a, a podcast where we were driving through Nebraska a couple weeks ago in the middle of the night. Everyone else was sleeping. It was um, a podcast about the church in Charleston, South, South Carolina, where Dylan Roof came in just over a year ago, two years ago, whatever it was, a little while ago. And he came, you may remember, he came into a Bible study. And he joined the Bible study, and they welcomed him, and they prayed together. And at the end of, the, of an African-American church, a white supremacist came to join them. And as they all bowed their heads at the end of their, their prayer time together, and everyone prayed, Dylan took out a gun and started shooting. And now, for the last couple of years, the church has been struggling through what does it mean for us to be Christian toward Dylan Roof? And some of them have worked hard to be able to forgive Dylan, and others think we can't forgive him until he shows any sort of repentance, and he is not showing any sort of repentance. And some have said we can't forgive until our nation deals with the reality of racism and the ongoing effects of it in our culture today and how it affects us as African Americans. How can we forgive when the system is still as racist as it's always been, they say? But they're wrestling with how do we forgive when it's really hard? Because they know that as followers of Jesus, our response to sin needs to be to work toward forgiveness. It doesn't mean we get there easily. It doesn't mean that it's simple. It doesn't mean that we just pretend nothing bad happened. It means we do the hard work of acknowledging the pain and the suffering, and we figure out how to not seek revenge how to not hold it against, but to seek the benefit and the goodwill even of the people who have done something awful. And it is hard, but that's what God has done for us. Love is the one who has not sinned, willingly identifying with the sinner. Coming alongside and coming to understand their life. That's partly why it's important that Jesus had a body. Because Jesus can identify with what it's like to be you and me. Because he knows what it's like when you're hungry and you want to be hangry, but you really shouldn't be. He knows what it's like when you're tired and you're exhausted and you're frustrated and you feel powerless against those who, you, who are oppressing you. And he knows how all of that can lead to all sorts of unhealthy behaviors and sin in our lives, and yet he didn't sin, but he understands it. We love like Jesus when we do the hard work of having compassion for the people in our lives who are caught up in sin. When we do the hard work of understanding why they do what they do and why they struggle and how come they keep repeating the same sins over again. When we do the hard work of putting ourselves in the shoes of someone who's an addict or an alcoholic. When we put ourselves in the shoes of the coworker who lied because they didn't really do their work, but they're overwhelmed at home and they're afraid of losing their job, and we can have compassion for the bad decisions they made, even if we don't excuse them. We do the hard work of having compassion for the child who never calls, and we wish they would call, or for the parent who struggles to think beyond themselves because they're so narcissistic that they think their children are all about reflecting them, not about actually helping their kids become the people God made them to be. Do the hard work to have compassion for the people who blew up at us when we were in line at Myers. I'm sorry. You took a long time. No, <laughs> I didn't blow up at anyone. But there's that reality, right, that gets tense sometimes on Saturday mornings. There's long lines and people... Do we have compassion for people who might be stressed and overwhelmed when they're going about their daily life? We do the hard work of having compassion, or to use the old Christian word, we have pity on people who are struggling in sin and struggling with life, and rather than responding with judgment and rejection, 
we respond with love and compassion and kindness to those who struggle. Because love is the one who has been wronged, suffering the pain of those who did the wrong. This is where we get our theology. It's important to get our theology of the Trinity right. Because God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are all one. And so sometimes we get this weird theology that somehow God the Father is punishing Jesus the Son for what we did, but it's God taking on himself in the, in the person of Jesus all of the pain and suffering we cause willingly. Not punishing the Son, but taking on himself all of the sin that we have caused and bearing the, the consequences of that sin out of love for us. That's what love looks like taking the punishment, taking the pain, and not lashing out at those who have caused it so that we can be reconciled again. That's why the church in South Carolina is struggling so hard to forgive because this is central to Christianity, isn't it? If we don't get that forgiveness is not just what God does to us, but what we do for the world, we've missed part of the call of the gospel. And so love is doing the hard work of forgiving the people who've sinned against us when it's hard, and it's always hard. Because if it wasn't hard, it probably wasn't sin. But when people sin, it hurts and it wounds and we want them to pay. But part of the gospel for us is the good news that their sin will get taken care of by Jesus one way or the other. Either Jesus took the punishment for their sin on himself, he took the consequences of it on himself on the cross, or he says, when I come back, I'll deal out justice. You don't need to worry about it. Those are the two options for a Christian. We can either trust that Jesus paid the price on the cross for the sins we committed and the sins other people committed against us, or that Jesus will come back and deal with their sins if they haven't chosen to follow him when he comes back. What is not an option for Christians is to make other people pay for their sins. That is a Jesus thing. That is a God thing. It is not our place to judge, Jesus says. It is our place to forgive. It is our place to love. Because when you let go of your need to judge and condemn and punish, you free up a whole lot of time to actually love the people in your life who need to be loved. Lo the love of God is revealed in the life and death and the resurrection of Jesus and we're called to love that way. God moves first toward us in his love in Jesus. God's love for us, though, is confirmed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to wonder if God loves us because the presence of the Spirit in our lives confirms it. Now, there are some Christian traditions that argue that you need to have some sort of manifestation of the Holy Spirit in your life to prove that the Spirit is present. You need to speak in tongues, you need to have visions, you need to be able to heal people. They have all sorts of criteria of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But I think it's always good in those moments to go back to what Scripture says. And so this is what John says, how we know the Holy Spirit is in us. And in 1 John 4.15, he says this, If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God, meaning the Holy Spirit, lives in them and they in God. So how do we know if the Holy Spirit lives in us? If you acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Now, the assumption of that is if you acknowledge Jesus as God, then you're also acknowledging that he has authority in your life and you try to live under that, that authority and obey. But there's no magic experience you need. There's no emotional high that you need. There's no special powers you need to manifest in some way to know you have the Holy Spirit. If you profess that Jesus is the Son of God and submit to his authority as the Son of God and try to follow him, the Holy Spirit is alive and at work in you because apart from the work of the Spirit, you can't do that. The Spirit is alive and at work in you, which means we don't have to wonder, am I saved? If you proclaim Jesus as Lord and try to follow him, you do not need to wonder, am I doing enough? You're saved because the Spirit is confirmation that you've been loved and reconciled to God, which is good news, and it's why when you have the Spirit, love, John tells us, drives out fear. This is one of the things maybe we don't always understand anymore. But in the ancient world, most people lived in fear. They lived in fear of the gods because you never knew if you had done enough for God to accept you. And so there are always more sacrifices you could give. There are always more gods that you could go worship because maybe some other god is mad at you, so you could always go to another temple. There's always another worship service you can attend. There was always more you could do to try to prove that you were worthy of the gods and that, and that the god should like you and not be angry with you. 
And I think often we're not that different than those in the ancient world, even in the church. I listen to us sometimes and I sit with people and we talk about what's going on in their lives and I get a sense that many of us still live with this vague anxiety and sense of fear that we aren't good enough for God. That we go through our life wondering if God is going to punish us for the latest sin that we committed. And so if something bad happens, it must be because God's mad at us for this thing that we did because God's a God who wants to punish, we think. And so we wonder if we're doing enough at church to please God, and so we're always tempted to do more. We wonder if we are helping people enough, because let's be honest, there are always more people we could help. And so are we ever doing enough? We wonder if we have forgiven people enough, or if there's some other sins we ought to be letting go of, and we beat ourselves up when we struggle to forgive. And we wonder if we're good enough, if we're good enough employees, if we're good enough spouses, if we're good enough parents, if we're good enough children, if we're good enough friends, or if there's more we could be doing in all of those relationships to be the people God has called us to be, and we are constantly striving to be enough for God, to satisfy some external God we've created in our minds, and this anxiety of trying to be good enough leads to overfunctioning, to doing more than we should do, to take responsibility for things we're not responsible for. It leads to fear, it leads to anxiety, and ultimately it leads to hopelessness because I just have to let you know on something right now. You will never be good enough on your own. You will never be good enough on your own. There will always be sin you're dealing with in your life no matter how good you get. No matter how many good things you do, there will always be some good things that you left undone because you need to sleep and you need to eat, and you need time to take care of yourself. There will always be more that you could do. If it is about being good enough and doing enough, you will never stop striving, and you will never reach that moment where it's enough. Because you are a fallible, time-limited person. And the standards we set in our minds of what good enough is are higher than what God calls you to. Because what, do, what have we learned? That while you were still sinners, God loved you. He moved first. It wasn't about you being good enough. It does not matter what sins you have struggled with or are struggling with now. God loved you 10 minutes ago and he loves you right now and he's going to love you 10 minutes from now. It isn't about you. God is crazy about you. God loves you even though you're a mess up, just like me. It is not about being good enough. God already loves you. How do you know God loves you? If you proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God and you submit to his authority, it's proof God loves you because he lives in you. And he lived in you before you were good enough. Because it's not about you, it's about God. The gospel is not about us being religious and doing religious things and working really hard and being really good. The gospel is about how we can't do that enough. And so Jesus did it all for us. It's already been done. And sometimes in church we need to remind ourselves it's not about being enough for God. God is enough for you. And we need to live into that hope. Because when we, when we truly begin to believe the gospel, that we are loved as we are, that we are reconciled as we are, that we are forgiven of all of our sins, it actually frees us up to begin loving people. Because when you're doing good things for other people out of your fear and anxiety that you're not good enough, you're not actually loving them. You're loving you. Because you're doing those things so you can feel good about you. You're doing those things so other people can admire how good you are. You're doing those things so God will love you and it's entirely about you. And that isn't love because love is not self-centered. You can only love other people well when you recognize that God already loves you before you do anything for them. When you rest in the knowledge that you are loved, it frees you up to not have to strive to be good enough, to not have to be the perfect mission trip middle schooler, because you're not going to be. It frees you up to simply be the person you are and love people as you are, where you are, so that they can experience the love of God in you. That is the mission we've been given. It's the hope that we have. The love of God is revealed in Jesus that he came while we were still sinners. 
we know that we are loved because we proclaim Jesus as Lord and the Spirit it lives within us. And knowing that, we don't have to live in fear anymore. And because of that, God's love can lead us to begin to love God and other people just like God does, demanding and expecting nothing, simply out of love for them. This is what's different about Christian love and care for others. It flows not out of guilt or shame, but it flows out of gratitude for the love we've already received. It doesn't flow out of our need to be good. It doesn't flow out of our need for others to love us. It flows freely because we're simply loving people with the same love God gave us. We didn't earn it. We cannot lose it. God won't let go, so let's give it freely. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I confess today, and maybe we all confess today, that we can get caught in the trap of trying to be good enough for you, of trying to earn our way into your favor. And so we thank you today that before we did anything, you already loved us, that you are the one who reaches out, that you are the one who reconciles, that you are the one who forgives. Father, help us to live in the confident truth that we are already loved as we are and then to love others out of the confidence we have that we belong to you as your beloved kids. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.